please welcome Anita Wu. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Young Southeast Asian Leaders Initiative Town Hall. My name is Anita Wu, your moderator this afternoon. Today, we have the creme de la creme of ASEAN youth right here, gathered in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, in University of Malaya's Tunku Chancellor Hall. Having produced two Malaysian prime ministers, this venue is no stranger to young leaders such as yourselves. We are here because as youth under the age of 35, we currently represent 60% of the ASEAN population. And being the single largest demographic in ASEAN, we not only have an impact on our respective nations, but also across the region. From a global perspective, although ASEAN covers just 3% of land area, ASEAN is a single, as a single identity would rank as the seventh largest economy in the world. However, each nation within ASEAN is in a different place in our journeys towards development. Each journey unique. Deep poverty persists in the region, but one of the leaders tackling this issue is Indonesia's Dr. Sri Mulyani Indrawati, who is currently managing director of World Bank Group. Similarly, although the record on upholding human rights and democratic governance within the region still leaves much to be desired. Dao Aung San Suu Kyi's heroic struggle and triumph proves that mountains can be moved with determination and tenacity. ASEAN young entrepreneurs don't have to look far to know that success is within their reach. As AirAsia's Tan Sri Tony Fernandez carved his success from within this very region. Moreover, with a thriving scene in Southeast Asia, creative scene, who knows, the next Jimmy Chu could be amongst us this very moment. As our region faces the challenges inherent in a rapidly developing nation and economy, where perspectives on education, business, environment must change with the times, we should use our ingenuity and entrepreneurial spirit to change how we plan to overcome these obstacles and emerge stronger than ever. Southeast Asia is one of the most diversity-rich regions, home to an array of cultures and histories. And as we know, it was once even home to President Obama. The future of ASEAN will lie in its ability to not only celebrate this diversity, but to harness it as a key building block for our success. Today, the president himself will be taking questions directly from those present here, as well as questions submitted to you, submitted by you through Facebook and Twitter from around the region. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming to stage the 44th president of the United States, President Barack Obama. Good afternoon. Selamat petang. Please, everybody have a seat. It is wonderful to be here, and it is wonderful to see uh, all these outstanding young people here. Uh, I, I want to thank, uh, first of all, the University of uh, Malaya for hosting us. Uh, I want to thank the Malaysian people for making us feel so welcome. Uh, Anita, thank you for uh, helping to moderate. Yeah, these trips are, are usually all business for me. Uh, but every once in a while, I want to have some fun. So, uh, so I try to hold an event like this where I get to hear directly from long, uh, young people like you. Because I, I firmly believe that you will shape the future of your countries. And 
the future of this region. Uh, and I'm glad to see so many students who are here today, including young people from across Southeast Asia. And I know some of you are joining us online and through social media, and you'll be able to ask me questions, too. Now, this is my fifth trip to Asia as president, and I plan to be back again later this year, uh, not just because uh, I enjoy the sights and the food, although I do, uh, but because a few years ago I made a deliberate and strategic decision as president of the United States that America will play a larger, more comprehensive role in this region's future. I know some still ask what this strategy is all about, so before I answer your questions, I just want to answer that one question. Why Asia is so important to America and why Southeast Asia has been a particular focus. And finally, why I believe that young people like you have to be the ones who lead us forward. Now, many of you know this part of the world has special meaning for me. Uh, I was born in Hawaii, uh, right in the middle of the Pacific. I lived in Indonesia as a boy. Hey! This is the Indonesian contingent. Yeah. Hey, that's where they're from. And my sister Maya was born in Jakarta. Uh, she's married to a man whose parents were born here. Uh, uh, my brother-in-law's father uh, in Sandakan, uh, and his, his mom in uh, Kudat. And, and my mother spent years working uh, in the villages of Southeast Asia, helping women buy sewing machines or gaining an education so that they could better earn a living. And I, as I mentioned uh, last night to His Majesty the King and the Prime Minister, uh, I'm very grateful to the Islamic Arts Museum Malaysia for hosting an exhibit that showcased some of my mother's batik collection, because it meant a lot to her, and it's part of the connection that I felt and I continue to feel to this region. So the Asia Pacific, uh, with its rich cultures and beautiful traditions and vibrant society, that's all part of who I am. It helped shape how I see the world. And it's also helped to shape my approach as president. And while our government, our financial centers, many of our traditions began along the Atlantic coast, America's always been a Pacific nation as well. Our biggest, most populous state is on the Pacific coast. And for generations, wave of immigrants from all across Asia from different countries and races and religions have come to America and contributed to our success. From our earliest years, when our first president, George Washington, sent a trade mission to China, through last year, when the aircraft carrier that bears his name, the George Washington, helped with typhoon relief in the Philippines, America's always had a history with Asia. And we've got a future with Asia. This is the world's fastest growing region. Over the next five years, nearly half of all economic growth outside the United States is projected to come from right here in Asia. That means this region is vital to creating jobs and opportunity, not only for yourselves, but also for the American people. And any serious leader in America recognizes that fact. And because you're home to more than half of humanity, Asia will largely define the contours of the century ahead, whether it's going to be marked by conflict or cooperation, by human suffering or human progress. So this is why America's refocused our attention on the vast potential of the Asia-Pacific region. My country's come through a decade in which we fought two wars and an economic crisis that hurt us badly, along with countries all over the globe. But we've now ended the war in Iraq. Our war in Afghanistan will end this year. Our businesses are steadily creating new jobs, and we've begun addressing the challenges that have weighed down our economy for, for, uh, for too long, reforming our health care and financial systems, raising standards in our schools, building a clean energy economy, cutting our fiscal deficits by more than half since I took office. So we've been busy at home. The crisis still confronts us uh, in other parts of the world, from Middle East to Ukraine. But I want to be very clear. Let me, let me be clear about this, because some people have wondered whether, because of what happens in Ukraine or what happens in the Middle East, uh, whether this will sideline our strategy. It has not. We are focused, and we're going to follow through on 
our interest in promoting uh, a strong U.S.-Asia relationship. America has responsibilities all around the world, and, and we're glad to embrace those responsibilities. And yes, sometimes we have a political system of our own, and it can be easy to lose sight of the long view. But we have been moving forward on our rebalance to this part of the world by opening ties of commerce and negotiating our most ambitious trade agreement, by increasing our defense and educational exchange cooperation, and modernizing our alliances, by participating fully in regional institutions like the East Asia Summit, building deeper partnerships with emerging powers like Indonesia and Vietnam. And increasingly, we're building these partnerships throughout Southeast Asia. Since President Johnson's visit here to Malaysia in 1966, there's perhaps no region on Earth that has changed so dramatically. Old dictatorships have crumbled. New voices have emerged. Controlled economies have given way to free markets. What, what used to be small villages, kampongs, are now gleaming skyscrapers. The 10 nations that make up ASEAN are home to nearly one in 10 of the world's citizens. And when you put those countries together, you're the seventh largest economy in the world, the fourth largest market for American exports, the number one destination for American investment in Asia. And I'm proud to be the first American president to meet regularly with all 10 ASEAN leaders. And I intend to do it every year that I remain president. By the way, I want to congratulate Malaysia on its turn to assume the chairmanship of ASEAN next year. You know, Malaysia plays a central role in this region that will only keep growing over time with an ability to promote economic growth and opportunity and be an anchor of stability and maritime security. Now, one of the things that, that makes this re region so interesting is its diversity. You know, th that diversity creates an, a unique intersection of humanity. People from so many ethnic groups and backgrounds and religions and political beliefs. It gives Malaysia, as, as one primary example, the chance to prove, as America constantly tries to prove, that nations are stronger and more successful when they work to uphold the civil rights and political rights and human rights of all their citizens. That's why, over the past few years, Prime Minister Najib and I have worked to broaden and deepen the relationship between our two countries. In the same spirit of Bekerja uh, Sama, you know, that, 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 that I think so many of you embody. You know, the United States remains the number one investor in Malaysia. We're partnering to promote security and shipping lanes. We're making progress on the Trans-Pacific Partnership to boost trade that supports good jobs and prosperity in both our countries. Today, I'm very pleased that we've forged a comprehensive partnership that lays the foundation for even closer cooperation for years to come. But our strategy is more than just security alliances or trade agreements. It's also about building genuine relationships between the peoples of Asia and the peoples of the United States, especially young people. We want you to be getting to know the young people of the United States and, and partnering well into the future in science and technology and entrepreneurship and education. One program that we're proud of here in Malaysia is the Fulbright English Teaching Assistance Program. Great. Yeah. Hey, there we go. Over the past two years, nearly 200 Americans have come here, and they haven't just taught English. They've made lifelong friendships with their students and their communities. Now, one of these Americans, I'm told, was a young woman named Kelsey from a city in Boston, the city of Boston. Last year, after the Boston Marathon was attacked, she taught her students all about her hometown, its history and its culture. She, she taught them a phrase that's popular in Boston, wicked awesome. So that was part of the English curriculum. <laughs> and so her students began to feel like a place that, 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 that this place, Boston, that was a world away, was actually something they understood and they connected to and they cared about. 
So they responded by writing get well cards and sending them to hospitals where many of the victims were being treated. You know, partnerships like those remind us that the relationship between nations is not just defined by governments, but it's defined by people, especially the young people who will determine the future long after those of us uh, who are currently in positions of power leave the stage. And that's especially true in Southeast Asia because almost two-thirds of the population in this region is under 35 years old. This is a young part of the world. And I've seen the hope and the energy and optimism of your generation wherever I travel, from Rangoon to Jakarta to here in Kale. I've seen the desire for conflict resolution through diplomacy and not war. I've seen the desire for prosperity through entre entrepreneurship not corruption or cronyism. I've seen a longing for harmony, not by holding down one segment of society, but by upholding the rights of every human being, regardless of what they look like or, or who they love or how they pray. And so you give me hope. Robert Kennedy once said, it is a revolutionary world that we live in, and thus it is young people who must take the lead. And I believe it is precisely because you've come of age in such a world with fewer walls, with instant information. You know, you have the world at your fingertips, and you can change it for the better. And I believe that together we can, we can do things that your parents, your grandparents, your great-grandparents would have never imagined. So today I'm proud that we're launching a new Young Southeast Asian Leaders Initiative to increase and enhance America's engagement with young people across the region. You're, you're part of uh, this new effort. You're the next generation of leaders in government and civil society and business and the arts. Some of you have already founded nonprofit organizations to promote human rights or prevent human trafficking or encourage religious tolerance and interfaith dialogue. Some of you have started projects to educate young people on the environment and engage them to protect our air and our water and to prevent climate change. Some of you have been building your own ASEAN-wide network of young leaders to meet challenges like youth unemployment. And, and I know that some of you have been spending this weekend collaborating on solutions to these major issues. And over the next few months, across Southeast Asia, we're going to find ways to listen to young people about your ideas and the partnerships we can then build together to empower your efforts develop new exchanges, connect young leaders across Southeast Asia with young Americans. So that's part of what we're starting here today. And before I take your questions, let me just close by sharing with you the future I, that I want to work for in this region, about where we want America's rebalance in the Asia Pacific to lead, the work that we can do together. I believe that together we can make the Asia Pacific more secure. You know, America has the strongest military in the world, but we don't seek conflict. We seek to keep the peace. We want a future where disputes are resolved peacefully and where bigger nations don't bully smaller nations. All nations are equal in the eyes of international law. We want to deepen our cooperation with other nations on issues like counterterrorism and privacy, but also humanitarian aid and disaster relief, which will help us respond quickly to catastrophes like the tsunami in Japan or the typhoon in the Philippines. We want to do that together. Together, we want to make the Asia Pacific more prosperous with more commerce and, and shared in, innovation and entrepreneurship. And we want to see broader and more inclusive development and prosperity. Through agreements like the TPP, we want to make sure nations in the Asia Pacific can trade under rules that ensure fair access to markets and support jobs and economic growth for everybody, and set high standards for the protection of workers and the environment. Together, we want to make the Asia Pacific and the world cleaner and more secure. You know, the nations of this region are uniquely threatened by climate change. No nation is immune to dangerous and disruptive weather patterns, so every nation is going to have to do its part. The United States is ready to do ours. Last year, I introduced America's first ever climate action plan to use more clean energy and less dirty energy and cut the dangerous carbon pollution that 
contributes to climate change. So we want to cooperate with countries in Southeast Asia to do the same, to combat the destruction of our forests. We can't condemn future generations to a planet that is beyond fixing. We can only do that together. Together, we can make this world more just. You know, America is the world's oldest constitutional democracy. That means we're going to stand up for democracy. It's a part of who we are. And we do this not only because we think it's right, but because it's been proven to be the most stable and successful form of government. In recent decades, many Asian nations have shown that different nations can realize the promise of self-government in their own way. They have their own path. But we must recognize that democracies don't stop just with elections. They also depend on strong uh, institutions and a vibrant civil society, an open political space, and tolerance of people who are different than you. We have to create an environment where the rights of every citizen, regardless of race or gender or religion or sexual orientation, are not only protected but respected. So we want a future where nations that are pursuing reform, like uh, Myanmar, like Burma, consolidate their own democracy and allow for people of different faiths and ethnicities to live together in peace. We want to see open space for civil society in all our countries so that citizens can hold their governments accountable and improve their own communities. We want to work together to ensure that we're drawing on the potential of all our people, and that means ensuring women have full and equal access to opportunity, just like men. And to make sure we can sustain all these efforts, we want a future where we're building an, an, an architecture of institutions and relationships. For America, that always begins with our alliances, which serve as the cornerstone of our approach to the world. But we also want to work with organizations like ASEAN and in for forums like APEC and the East Asia Summit to resolve disputes and forge new partnerships. And we want to cooperate with our old allies and our emerging partners and with China. We, we want to see a peaceful rise for China because we think it can and should contribute to the stability and prosperity that we all seek. So that's the shared future I want to see in the Asia Pacific. Now, America cannot impose that future. It's one that we need to build together in partnership with all the nations and peoples of the region, especially young people. That vision is within our reach if we're willing to work for it. Now, this world has its share of threats and challenges, and that's usually what makes the news. We know that progress can always be reversed, and that positive change is achieved not through passion alone, but through patient and persistent effort. But we, we've seen things change for the better in this region and around the world because of the effort of ordinary people together, working together. It's possible. We've seen it in the opportunity and progress that's been unleashed in this amazing part of the world. So I've only been in Malaysia for a day, but I've already picked up a new phrase. Uh, Malaysia bole. <laughs> Malaysia can do it. Now, I have to say we have a similar saying in America, yes, we can. <laughs> That's the spirit in which I hope America and all the nations of Southeast Asia can work together. But it's going to depend on your generation to carry it forward. Because presidents and prime ministers, they can help lay the foundation. But you've got to build the future. So now, uh, I want to hear directly from you. I want to hear your aspirations for your own lives, your hopes for your communities and your culture, what you think we can do together uh, in the years to come. All right? Terima kasih banyak. Thank you very much, Mr. President. If you may. Well, I'm going to take uh, the first question, and then I think Anita is going to uh, take a question from uh, social media. Oh, this is tough because we have so many outstanding young people. I'll call on this young lady right here, right in the front. Tell me, tell me your name. Uh, if you're going to school, tell me uh, uh, what uh, level you're at. 
what year you are in school and uh, where you're from. Um, hi, Mr. President. My name is Su Kim. I'm from Cambodia, and I went to um, Institute of Foreign Languages, the mm -hmm. Royal University of Phnom Penh. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've got a very simple question for you. Uh -huh. um, what was your dream when you were in your 20s? And did you achieve it? And if so, how did you achieve it? Well, the, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a short question, but it's not a simple one. You know, um, when I was uh, in high school, so for those of you who, who don't, you know, are, are studying under a different system, when I was 15, 16, 17, before I went to the university, um, I wasn't always the best student. Sometimes I, sometimes I was uh, uh, enjoying life too much. <laughs> don't clap. There you are. There. <laughs> this guy's the same way. Um, no, no. The, the uh, you know, part of it, I was rebelling. It was, you know, which is natural for young people that age. Uh, I didn't know my father, and uh, so my family life was complicated. So, so I didn't always focus on my studies. Uh, and that probably carried over into the first two years of university, but, but around the age of 20, I began to realize that uh, that I could have an impact on the world if uh, I applied myself more. I became interested uh, in uh, social policy and government, and I decided that I wanted to work uh, in the nonprofit sector for uh, people who were disadvantaged in the United States. And so I was able to, to do that for three years after I graduated from college. That's how I moved to the, the city of Chicago. I was hired by a group of churches to work in poor areas to help people get jobs and help uh, improve housing and give young people more opportunity. And that was a great experience for me. And then I, it led me to go to law school and to practice uh, civil rights law and then ultimately to run for elected office. Um, and, you know, when I think back to my journey, my path, I think the most important thing for me and maybe the most important thing for all the young people here is to realize that you really can have an impact on the world. Uh, you can achieve your dreams, but uh, in order to do so, uh, you, you have to uh, focus not so much on a title or how much money you're going to make. You have to focus more on uh, what kind of influence and impact are you going to have on other people's lives. You know, uh, what good can you do in the world? Now, it, it, that may involve starting a business, but if, if you want to start a business, you should be really excited about the, the, the product or the service that you're making. It shouldn't just be how much money I can make. Because the business people that I meet who are, do amazing things, like Bill Gates, uh, you know, who started Microsoft, or, they're usually people who are really interested in what they do. And they really think that it can make a difference in people's lives. Um, if you want to go into government, you shouldn't just want to be uh, a particular government official. You should want to go into government because you think it can help educate some children or it can help uh, provide jobs for people who need work. Uh, so I think the most important thing for me was when I started thinking more about other people and how I could have an impact in my larger society and community and wasn't just thinking about myself. That's when I think your dreams can really take off. Uh, because if, if you're only thinking about you, then your world is small. If you're thinking about others, then your world gets bigger. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. We now have a question from the social media, which we've been collecting over the week. Okay. The question comes from our friend, So Tet Aungkant from Burma, or Myanmar. Hmm. And he asks... Mr. President, what would be your own keywords 
or encouragement for each of us, leaders of our next generation, while we are cooperating with numerous diversities, such as different races, languages, beliefs, and cultures, not only in Myanmar, but also across ASEAN? Good. Thank you. Well, it's a great question. Um, if you look at the biggest source of conflict and war and hardship around the world, one of the most, if not the most important reasons is people treating those who are not like them differently, right? So in Myanmar right now, they're going through a transition after decades of uh, repressive government. They're trying to open things up and make the country more democratic. And that's a very courageous process that they're going through. But the danger, now that they're democratizing, is that there are different ethnic groups and different religions inside of Myanmar. And if people start organizing politically around their religious identity or around uh, their ethnic identity, as opposed to organizing around principles of justice and rule of law and democracy, then you can actually start seeing conflicts inside those countries that could move Myanmar in a very bad direction. In particular, you've got a Muslim minority uh, inside of Myanmar right now that uh, the broader population uh, has historically looked down upon and whose rights are not fully being protected. Now, that's not unique to Myanmar, right? Here in Malaysia, we, this is a majority Muslim country. So then there are times where those who are non-Muslims find themselves perhaps being disadvantaged or experiencing hostility. In the United States, obviously, historically, the biggest conflicts arose around race. And we had to fight a civil war, and we had to have a civil rights movement over the course of generations until I could stand before you as uh, a president of African descent. But of course, you know, the job's not done. There, there's still discrimination and prejudice and, and ethnic conflict inside the United States that we have to be vigilant against. So, so my point is, all of us have within us uh, biases and prejudices of people who are not like us or were not raised in the same faith or come from a different ethnic background. But the world is shrinking. It's getting smaller. You could think that way when we were all living in, separately in villages and tribes and we didn't have contact with each other. We now have the internet and smartphones and our cultures are all colliding. The, the world has gotten smaller. And no country is going to succeed if a part of its population is put on the sidelines because they're discriminated against. Malaysia won't succeed if non-Muslims don't have opportunity. <laughs> Myanmar won't succeed if the Muslim population is oppressed. No, no society is going to succeed if half your population, meaning women, aren't getting the same education and employment opportunities as men. It, so, so I think the, the, the key point for all of you, especially as young people, is you, know, you should embrace your culture. You should be proud of who you are and your background and you know, you should uh, appreciate the differences in language and food and uh, how you worship God uh, is going to be different. 
And, and those are things that you should be proud of. But it shouldn't be a tool to look down on somebody else. It shouldn't be uh, a reason to discriminate. And, and you have to make sure that you are speaking out against that in your daily life. And as you emerge as leaders, you should be on the side of politics that brings people together rather than drives them apart. That is one of, that is the most important thing for this generation. And, and, and part of the way to do that is to be able to stand in other people's shoes and see through their eyes. Almost every religion has within it the basic principle that I, as, as a Christian, uh, uh, understand from the teachings of Jesus. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Treat people the way you want to be treated. And if you're not doing that, and if society is not respecting that basic principle, then we're going backwards instead of going forward. And, and this is true all around the world. And sometimes it's, it's among uh, groups that those of us on the outside, we look, they look exactly the same. In Northern Ireland, th there has been a raging conflict, although they have finally come to arrive at peace, because half you know, or, or a, a, a portion of the population is Catholic, a portion is Protestant. Now, from the outside, you look, you know, why are they arguing? They're both Irish, they speak the same language. It seems as if they'd have nothing to argue about. But that's been uh, a part of Ireland that has been held back and is poorer and less developed than the part of Ireland that didn't have that conflict. In Africa, you, know, you go to countries, my father's country of Kenya, where oftentimes you've seen tribal conflicts. From the outside, you'd think, what are they arguing about? This is a country that has huge potential. They should be growing. But instead, they spend all their time arguing and organizing politically only around tribe and around ethnicity. And then when one gets on top, they're suspicious and they, they're worried that the other might take advantage of them. And when power shifts, then it's payback. And we see that in society after society. The most important thing young people can do is break out of that mindset. You know, when I was in Korea, I had a chance to, uh, or in Tokyo, rather, I had a chance to uh, see an exhibit with uh, an astronaut, a Japanese astronaut who was at the International Space Station that was looking at the entire globe, and they're tracking now weather, changing weather patterns in part because it gives us the ability to respond to disasters quicker. And when you see astronauts from Japan or from the United States or from Russia or others working together and they're looking down at this planet from a distance, you realize we're all on this little rock in the middle of space. And the differences that seem so important to us from a distance dissolve into nothing. And, and so we have to have that same perspective, respecting everybody, treating everybody uh, equally under the law. That has to be a principle that all of you uphold. All right? Good. Great question. Um, let, me, let, me, let me call on the, you know, I'm going to go boy, girl, boy, girl, so that uh, it, everybody gets a fair chance. Uh, let's see. Hold on. Oh, this gentleman right here. Right there, with the glasses, yeah. There you go. Hello, Mr. President. Hello. Um, I have a, my name is Lukman, and I'm from Malaysia. Uh -huh. um, currently with YES Alumni in Malaysia. Well, I have a question. I wonder what was your first project, project, community service project that you did in life, and how did the project impact your community? Thank you so much. That's a great question. I, uh, I told you that when I uh, graduated from college, I wanted to work in poor neighborhoods, and so I 
moved to Chicago and I worked. Uh, these, this community had, had gone through some very difficult times. The steel plants there, the steel mills had closed. A lot of manufacturing was moving out of America or becoming technologically obsolete, these old mills. And so th these were areas that had been entirely dependent on steel. And as those jobs left, the communities were being abandoned. Um, and there was also racial change in the area. They had been predominantly white, then uh, blacks and uh, uh, Latinos had moved in, and there was fear among the various groups. So they had a lot of problems. Uh, I will tell you this. That, that what, what I did was I, I organized a series of meetings listening to people to find out what they wanted to do something about first. The, the, the most immediate problem they saw was there was a lot of crime that had emerged in the area, but they didn't quite know how to do anything about it. So I organized a meeting with the police commander so that they could file their complaints directly to the police commander and try to get more action to uh, create more safe space in those communities for children and to end people standing on street corners and uh, because it was depressing the whole community. Now, here's the main thing I want to tell you. That first meeting, nobody came. It was a complete failure. And I was very depressed. <laughs> Because I thought, well, everybody said that they were concerned about crime, but when I organized the meeting, nobody came. And what it made me realize is, is that um, if you want to bring about change in a community uh, or in a nation, it's, it's not going to happen overnight. Usually, it's very hard to bring about change because people are busy in their daily lives. They have things to do. Some of the things I realized was I hadn't organized the meeting at the right time. It was right around dinner time, and if people were working, they were coming home and picking up their kids, and they couldn't get to the meeting fast enough. And, right? So first of all, you've got to try to get people involved, and a lot of people are busy in their own lives, or they're, they don't think it's going to make a difference, or they're scared if they're speaking out against authority. And many of the problems that we're facing, like trying to create jobs or better opportunity, or dealing with poverty, or dealing with the environment, these are problems that have been going on for decades. And so to think that somehow you're going to change it in a day or a week, and then if it doesn't happen, you just give up, well, then you definitely won't succeed. So the most important thing uh, that I learned as a young person trying to bring about change is you have to be persistent. And you have to get more people involved. And you have to form relationships with different groups and different organizations. And you have to listen to people about what they're feeling and what they're concerned about and build trust. And then you have to try to find a small part of the problem and get success on that first so that maybe from there you can start something else and make it bigger and make it bigger uh, until over time you are really making a difference uh, in your community and, and in that problem. But you can't be impatient. And the, pro the great thing about young people is they're impatient. The biggest problem with young people is they're impatient. Right? It's a strength because it's what makes you want to change things. But sometimes you can be disappointed if change doesn't happen right away. And then you just give up. And you just have to stay with it uh, and learn from your, your failures as well as your successes. OK. Anita? Mr. President, thank yeah. you very much. We have a question from our friend in Singapore. Mm -hmm. His name is Stan Lee Ong. He asks, what is the legacy you wish to leave behind? Well, uh, you know, I've, I've still got two and a half years left as president, so I, I, hope, I hope he's not rushing me. <laughs> <laughs> the, 
But um, what is true is, is that, you know, as, as President of the United States, uh, you have so many issues coming at you every day. But sometimes I, I try to step back and think about 20 years from now when I look back, what will I be most proud of or what do I think uh, will be most important uh, in the work that I've done. Uh, now, my most important legacy is Malia and Sasha, who are turning out to be wonderful young people. Uh, so your, your children, if you're a parent, if you're a parent, the most important legacy you have is, is, uh, is, is great children. And I, I have those uh, who are happy and healthy, and, and uh, I think they're going to do great things. Uh, another important legacy is, is being a good husband. So I've, I've tried to do that. That's important. Because if you don't do those things well, then everything else you're going to have some problems with. Um, but I think as president, uh, what, I've, what I've tried to do in, in the United States is really focus on how do you create opportunity for all people. And when I first came into office, we were in a huge financial crisis that had hit the entire world. And it was the worst crisis that the United States had had since the 1930s. So the first thing I had to do was just make sure that we stopped the crisis and start allowing the economy to recover. And we've now created more than 9 million jobs. And, and the economy is beginning to, to, to improve for a lot of people. But what you've also seen is a trend in the United States, but also around the world, in which even when the economy grows, it tends to benefit a lot of people at the very top. But the vast majority of people, they don't benefit as much. And you're starting to see bigger and bigger gaps in inequality and in wealth and in opportunity. And that's true not just in the United States. It's true in Europe. It's long been true in parts of Asia. It's been true in Latin America. And it, I believe that economies work best when growth and development is broad-based, when it's shared, when ordinary people, if they work hard and they take responsibility, they can succeed. Not everybody is going to be rich, but everybody should be able to live a good life. Not everybody is going to be uh, a billionaire, but everybody should be able to have a nice home and educate their children and feel some sense of security. So that's not something that I can do by myself as President of the United States. but. Everything that I do, whether it's uh, providing more help for people to go to college or giving early childhood uh, education to young children because we know that the younger children get some additional uh, initial schooling, especially poor children, the better off they'll do in school for all the years to come, to uh, the work that we're trying to do uh, in providing health care for all Americans so that they don't uh, experience a crisis when somebody in their family gets sick. All of those efforts are with the objective of making sure that ordinary people, if they work hard and they act responsibly, they can succeed. And internationally, my main goal has been to work with other partners to promote uh, a system of rules so that Conflicts can be resolved peacefully so that nations observe basic uh, rules of behavior so that whether you're a big country or a small country, you know that uh, there are certain principles that are observed uh, that might doesn't just make right, but that there's uh, a set of ideals and, and the, there, there's justice. 
both inside countries and between countries. Now, that means you know, trying to end uh, the proliferation of, of nuclear weapons, which are a threat to humanity. And we've made progress in that front, me negotiating uh, the reduction of, of uh, our nuclear stockpiles with the Russians and trying to uh, resolve through diplomacy uh, the problem that Iran has been trying to pursue nuclear weapons and working with countries like Malaysia to prevent the proliferation of nuclear weapons. Uh, that means uh, uh, working to uh, get chemical weapons out of Syria. It means trying to promote uh, a just peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Uh, it means opening up uh, to Burma. And I was the first president to visit there and seeing if we could take advantage of the opportunity with uh, Anyang Suu Kyi's release to create an, uh, a country that was a responsible uh, part of uh, the world order. Now, you know, sometimes our efforts have been successful. Sometimes, just as I told this young man here, uh, my efforts initially haven't been as successful, and I've had to keep on trying. And I am confident that when I'm done as president, there's still going to be parts of the world that are having war, that are having conflict, that uh, are oppressing their own people. So I'm not going to solve all these problems. I've got to leave some work for all of you. Um, but what I do hope is, is that I, I will have made progress on each of those fronts. Uh, so that, you know, if, if when I leave I can say, there are a few more countries that are democracies now, and they, uh, the United States helped. If there are countries where I can say, or, or, or areas of the world where I can say, we avoided conflict between two countries because we helped to mediate a dispute. You know, I'll be proud of that. If there are countries where um, the spotlight has been shined internationally on uh, the oppression of a minority group and it has forced that country to change its practices, that will be a success. Um, but I don't consider uh, I, I don't think I can do that by myself, of course. I can only do that not only with the cooperation and consultation of other leaders, but it's also other citizens of the world. All of you and uh, people in, in various regions, they've got to want more justice and more peace in order for us to achieve it. You know, sometimes the United States is viewed as, on the one hand, the cause of everybody's problem, or, on the other hand, the United States is expected to solve everybody's problem. And we are a big, powerful nation, and we take our responsibilities very seriously. But we can only do so much. Ultimately, the people in these countries themselves have to partner with us, and you know, because we have problems in our own country that we have to solve. Um, but hopefully, I'm also lifting up certain universal principles and ideals that all of us can embrace and share. Uh, all right. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a woman's turn. It's a young woman's turn. I, I've got to, let's see who's back here. Uh, no, no, it's a young lady's turn. Uh, okay, this young lady right here. Since the microphone's right there. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. President. Welcome to Malaysia. So gathering from what you've said, um, I think it's a shared consensus that youth worldwide can be the catalyst to plant the seeds for an early conditioning on certain global issues, yeah? So um, my question is, how exactly can America lead us youth internationally in championing such issues? For example, you know, um, climate change, women empowerment, poverty eradication, um, particularly to bring the human race together it appears that a lot of policies are being put in place, but a lot of these policies are being put in place by the Gen Xs, you know, or the baby boomers. Uh, people like us, the Gen Ys, really don't have a say in these policies, but we are supposed to champion them. So how are we supposed to do all these things? Well, the, uh, 
First of all, I don't. I'm trying. I'm trying to figure out which generation I am. <laughs> you got uh, baby boomers, then Gen X, and then this is Gen Y. We're on Y. Is 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 Z? Uh, Z? Are they here yet, or th that that's next? Um, well, first of all, just to be very specific, uh, as I said in my speech. Part of the reason that I like to meet with young people uh, is to get their suggestions and their ideas. But then what we try to do is set up a process and a network of, of, of young leaders who can share ideas with each other and with us to let us know how they think we can uh, empower you. So coming out of this meeting, there will be mechanisms through social media and in our embassies uh, in each of the uh, 10 ASEAN countries, where we're going to be bringing together youth leaders to talk to each other about their plans, what their priorities are, how they think the United States can be most helpful. And we're going to get, we're going to take your suggestions. Uh, and let's take the example of, of something like climate change. The voice of young people on this issue is so important because you are the ones who are going to have to deal with the consequences of this most significantly. You know, I, I rode with Prime Minister Najib from our press conference to the new magic center that's been set up here, an entrepreneurial center that came out of our Global Entrepreneur uh, Summit that was hosted here in Malaysia. And on the ride over, it hadn't started raining yet. But you could tell it was going to be raining soon. And he said that here in Malaysia, you've already seen uh, a change in weather patterns. It used to be that you know, the dry season, the rainy season was very clear. Now it all just kind of is blurring together. Now, not all of that can be directly attributed you know, precisely to climate change. But when you look at what's been happening all across the country, or all around the world. There's no doubt that weather patterns are changing. It is getting warmer. That is going to have impacts in terms of more flooding, more drought, displacement, could affect food supplies, could affect the incidence of diseases. Coastal communities could be severely affected. And what happens when humans are placed under stress is the likelihood of conflict increases. There's a theory that one of the things that happened in Syria to trigger the protests that resulted in the terrible, violent uh, efforts to suppress them by President Assad was repeated drought in Syria that drove people off their lands so they, they could no longer afford to make the traditional living that they had made. Now, whether that's true or not, uh, we don't know precisely. But what we do know is, is that you see in communities that are under severe weather pressure, drought, famine, food prices increasing, they're more likely to be in conflict. And you're going to have to deal with this unless we do something about it. So the question is, well, what can we do? Every country should be coming up with a climate action plan to try to reduce its carbon emissions. In Southeast Asia, one of the most important issues is deforestation. In, in Indonesia, in Malaysia, what you've seen is huge portions of, of tropical forests that actually use carbon and so reduce the effects of climate change, reduce carbon uh, being released into the atmosphere and warming the planet. They're just being shredded because of primarily the palm oil industry. And there are large business interests behind that industry. Now, the question is, are we going to uh, in each of those countries say, how can we help preserve these forests whilst 
using a different approach to economic development that does less to damage the atmosphere. And that means engaging then with the various stakeholders. You've got to talk to the businesses involved. You've got to talk to the government. The communities who may be getting jobs, because you know, their first uh, priority is feeding themselves. So if you just say, we've got to stop cutting down the forest, but you don't have an alternative opportunity for people, then they may just ignore you. So there are going to be all kinds of pieces just to that one part of the problem. And each country may have a different uh, element to it. The point, though, is, is that you have to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. You have to say this is important. You don't have to be a climate science expert, but you can educate yourselves on the issue. You can discuss it with your peer groups. You can organize young people to interact with uh, international organizations that are already dealing with this issue. You can help to publicize it. You can educate your parents, friends, co-workers. And through that process, you can potentially change policy. So, you know, it may take, it will take years. It will not happen next week. But our hope is, is that through this uh, network that we're going to be developing, that we can be a partner with you in that process. All right? So I just want to check how many, how many, uh, uh, how much time do we have here? Who, who's in charge? We've got time, Mr. Anita, President. We got, a, uh, how much time? A couple more questions. A couple more questions. All right, because I just want to make sure that I'm being fair here. All right, it's a guy's turn. <laughs> uh, the, uh, Let's see. All right, how about this guy? Because I like his haircut, the guy, the guy with the spiky hair right there. All right. <laughs> yes. Salama Sajatur, uh, Mr. President. My name is Chong Yap. Uh, I'm, an event, I'm an event organizer and the curator of TEDx Youth at KL. Um, in your opinion, what are the top three advice to fellow Malaysians and government to become, a to become a developed country in six years' time? As this is one of our, one of our country's visions, and I, think it, and I think it's important for fellow Malaysians to, um, to contribute together in order to achieve that. Thank, thank you. Well, I had an uh, extensive conversation with Prime Minister Najib uh, about uh, his development strategy. For, first of all, uh, Malaysia is now a, 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 a middle-income country. Uh, it's done much better than many other countries in per capita income and growth uh, over the last two decades. And there's been some wise leadership uh, that has helped to promote Malaysian exports and helped to train its people. You've got high literacy rates, which is critically important. Investing in people is the single most important thing in the knowledge economy. Right? Traditionally, uh, wealth was defined by land and natural resources. Today, all the, the most important resources between our ears. And Malaysia has made a good investment in young people. So that continues to be, I think, the most important strategy for growth in the 21st century. And in the United States, my main focus is improving ed the, our education system and lifelong learning. Because part of what's changed in the economy, in the 20th century, you got a job at a company. You might stay there for 30 years. Things didn't change that much. Now, you may be at one company, and that company may be absorbed, and you might have to retrain for a new job because the thing that you were doing before has been made obsolete because of technology. So we have to keep on investing in not only elementary school and secondary school or, and even universities, but in the United States, for example, we have a system of community colleges and job training where somebody who's in their 30s or even 40s or 50s can go back, get retrained, get more skills, adapt to uh, a new industry, 
and then be a productive citizen. That's a critical investment that needs to be made. The second thing that I know Prime Minister Najib is focused on, and this applies throughout the region, is if you want to move to the next level of development, then you have to open up an economy to innovation and entrepreneurship. The initial push for growth in Southeast Asia initially started with uh, exporting raw materials and then shifted to manufacturing and light assembly uh, and being part of the global supply chain. And that's all a, a, a very important ladder into development. But now, a lot of wealth is being created by new products and new ideas. And at least in the United States, for example, we don't want to just assemble the latest uh, smartphone. We want to invent the latest smartphone. We want to invent the apps and the content for those smartphones. And then, you know, we have an asset that whoever is manufacturing it, some of the value is still flowing to us. Well, what that requires then is, is changes in the economy to make it more open, to make it more entrepreneurial. There, some of the old systems have to be broken down. Um, now, different countries in ASEAN and different countries around the world are at different stages of development. Um, in some countries, the most important thing for development is just basic rule of law. And something that I said earlier, which is uh, making sure that the law applies to everybody in the same way. I believe if Malaysia is going to take that next leap, then it's going to have to make sure that the economy uh, is one where everybody has the opportunity regardless of where they started, to succeed. Uh, and that energy has to be unleashed. Um, and I think that, I think Prime Minister Najib uh, understands that. And, you know, the, the, uh, the trade agreement that we're trying to create, uh, the TPP, part of what we're trying to do is to create higher standards for labor protection, higher standards for environmental protection, uh, more consistent uh, protection of uh, intellectual property, because increasingly that's the next phase of wealth. Uh, all those things require more transparency and more accountability and more rule of law. Uh, and, and I think that uh, it's entirely consistent with Malaysia moving into the next phase. Now, it's, it's hard to change old ways of doing things. And that's true for every country. I mean, China right now, you know, after unprecedented growth over the last 20 years, realizes it's got to change its whole strategy. It's been so export-oriented, but now they start, they're starting to realize that if they want to continue to grow, they've got to develop consumer markets inside their own country. And what that means is, is that they've got to uh, give workers more uh, ability to spend on consumer goods, and that they have to have a social safety net so that workers aren't just saving all the time because if they get sick, they don't have any social insurance programs, and they don't have any retirement programs. And so they're starting to make these shifts, but these are hard shifts. Even in a country that's controlled by the central party, that's not democratic, it's still hard because certain people have gotten accustomed to and done very well with an export-driven strategy. So when you shift, there's going to be somebody who resists. And that's true in every country. It's true in the United States. We've got to change how we do things. Um, and when, when you try to change, somebody somewhere is benefiting from the status quo. Uh, Malaysia is no different. But I'm confident that uh, you can make it happen. All right, I'll, I'll take two more questions. And it's a young lady's turn. Uh, so, guys, you can all put down your hands. 
Let's see. This young lady with the yellow. Uh, give it back. Good morning. Um, my name is Rida from Indonesia. I'm ah, apa kabar? Baik, baik saja. Baik. <laughs> well, okay. I have a very short question. What does happiness mean to you? What does happiness mean to me? Yeah. Wow, that, well, you guys, that, that's a big philosophical question. Um, well, the, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier my family, uh, and it really is true that the older I get, uh, the more, uh, you know, when I think about when I'm on my deathbed, I mean, I don't think about this all the time. I don't want you to think. <laughs> I'm still fairly young. Um, but when I think at the end of my life and I'm looking back, what will have been most important to me? I think it's the time I will have spent with the people I love. Um, and, and so that, that makes me happy. Um, but I also think that uh, as I get older, what's, what's, what's most important to me is feeling as if uh, I've been true to my beliefs and uh, that I've lived with some integrity. Now, that doesn't always make you happy in the sense of you're laughing or, uh, you know, uh, just enjoying life because sometimes being true to your beliefs is uncomfortable. Sometimes doing things that you think is, is right uh, may put you in some conflict with somebody. Sometimes uh, people may not appreciate it, and it may be inconvenient. Um, but, I, but I think that uh, you know, part of being at satisfied, at least with life, as you get older, is feeling as if you know that Every day you wake up and there's certain things you believe in, uh, in, for example, respecting other people or showing kindness uh, to others or uh, you know, trying to promote justice or whatever it is that you think is uh, best in you and that at the end of each day, you can say, okay, you know what? I, I, I was consistent with what I say I'm about, what I, what I say I believe in, you know, the, the image I have of myself. And when I'm uncomfortable is when I think, you know, I didn't do my best today. You know, maybe I didn't speak out when I should have spoken out. Maybe I didn't work as hard on this issue as I should have worked. Then, you know, I'm tossing and turning, and I'm, I don't feel good. Uh, and, and I think that, uh, you know, having that kind of integrity is, is important. Um, you know, where you can look at yourself in the mirror and you can say, okay, you know, I, I am who I, I want, who I, who I say I want to be. Uh, and nobody's perfect, and everybody's going to make mistakes, but I think if, if, if you feel as if uh, you're always striving towards your, your ideals, uh, then, then you'll, you'll feel okay at the end. Huh? Okay. Uh, last question, and it's, uh, let's see. No, 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 it's a guy's question. Women, put down your hands. <laughs> That's the, uh, okay, I'll, I'll call on this gentleman here because he, there you go, in the, with the glasses. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, good evening, Mr. President Obama. Well, my name is Kenny Lee Chiva from Malaysia. I'm an undergrad from University of Malaya under the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. So my question is, in your position right now, what values that you uphold the most that you think is very important that makes you what you are today and what do you wish to bring that value to the young people of today so that they can change the world to become a better world 
Thank you. Well, thank you. The uh, you know I'm gonna I'm gonna take another question after that because I've already answered this question. Let, no, wait, wait, wait. Let me ex <laughs> let me explain. The uh, you know what I think is most important is showing people respect who you disagree with, right? And so, so for example, there's a note over there. I don't know what those young people are putting a note about, but. Um, but I think that the basic idea that if somebody's not like you, if they look differently than you, if they believe differently than you, that you are treating them as you want to be treated, if you are applying those ideas, I think you're going to be halfway there in terms of solving most of the world's problems. Um, and, and a lot of that's around some of the traditional divisions that we have in our society, race, ethnicity, religion, gender. Um, treat people with respect, whoever they are, and expect your governments to treat everybody with respect. And if you do that, then you're going to be okay. All right. Uh, last question, young ladies. Now, wait, wait, wait. Everybody put down their hands for a second. Okay, now I've, I've, I've heard from, uh, I've, I've had an Indonesian, a Malaysian, a Cambodian, uh, Myanmar, Thailand, Thailand didn't get called on. So I think, uh, all right, Thailand's, Thailand's uh, raised, who, Thailand where? Okay. Oh, and the Philippines. Well, see, I can't, I can't call on everybody. <laughs> Thailand's, Thailand uh, uh, said, said uh, they, they were the first ones to, to shout. So go ahead, this young lady right here. Hi, Mr. President. Very short question. What are the things that you regret nowadays, like you should have done in the past? What are the things that I regret? Oh, the list is so long. I regret calling on you <laughs> because now I'm going to be telling everybody my business. No, I'm just joking about that. Um, I'm now 52, uh, and, you know, I, I still feel pretty good. I, I'm, a, I'm a little gray-haired. Uh, but I, I will tell you two, two things I regret. Um, one is very specific, one is more general. Uh, the specific thing is I regret not uh, having spent more time with my mother because she died early. She, she got cancer, and right around when she was my age, actually just, she was just a year, Older than me, uh, older than I am now, she died. Uh, it happened very fast in about six months, and I realized that, you know, there was a, a stretch of time from when I was, let's say, 20, until I was 30, where I was so busy with my own life that I didn't always reach out and communicate with her and ask her how she was doing and tell her about things. I, you know, I was nice and, and I'd call and you know, write once in a while, but this goes to what I was saying earlier about what you remember in the end, I think, is the people you love. Uh, I realized that I didn't uh, every single day or at least more often uh, just spend time with her and, and, and find out what she was thinking and what she was doing because she had been such an important part of my life. Um, now, that's natural as young people. Uh, you know, as, as you grow up, you become independent. But for those of you, uh, for those of you who have not called their parents lately, I would just say that that is something actually I regret. Um, the, the more general answer is, I regret wasting time. You know, when I, uh, I think when I was young, 
I spent a lot of time on things that I realize now were not very important. Uh, and I wish I had used my time more wisely. And so, now I, I don't want people to spend every minute of every day working all the time because you have to enjoy life and you have to have friends and you have to, uh, you, know, uh, you know, appreciate uh, uh, all that life has to offer. But I do think that uh, in, our, in America, at least, but now I think worldwide, we spend an awful lot of time on diversions. You know, watching TV or playing video games or... Uh, and, and all that time, when you add it all up, yeah, I say to myself, I could have spent more time learning a foreign language or I could have spent more time uh, you know, working on a project that was important. And I think it, it would be useful to, uh, for all of you to consider how you're spending your time uh, and make sure that you're making every day count. Um, let me just say this uh, by way of uh, thank you to all of you. I think you've, you've, you've asked terrific questions. Uh, I'm so impressed with all of you and what you have done and, and what you'll do in the future. Um, I do want you to feel optimistic about your future, even though I told you about the, some problems like climate change that seem so big now. Uh, I always say we, we get White House interns to come in and uh, uh, they work at the White House and they're there for six months and then I uh, usually speak to them at the end of six months. And I always tell them that despite how hard sometimes the world seems to be and all you see on television is war and conflict and poverty and violence. The truth is that if you had to choose when to be born, not knowing you know, where or who you would be, in all of human history, now would be the time. Because the, the world is less violent, it is healthier, it is wealthier, it is more tolerant, and it offers more opportunity than any time in human history for more people than any time in human history. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't still terrible things happening around the world or in this region or, you know, we still have things like human trafficking and we still have uh, terrible uh, abuse of, of children and... Uh, there are conflicts, and, and so there are all kinds of things that we're going to have to tackle and deal with. But you should know that with each successive generation, things have improved just a little bit. And over time, that little bit adds to a lot. And it's now up to you, the next generation, uh, to make sure that 20 years from now or 30 years from now, people look back and say, wow, things are a lot better now than they were back then. And there will still be problems 20 or 30 years from now also, but there will be different problems because you will have solved many of the problems that exist uh, today. And America wants to be a partner with you in that process. So good luck. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Mr. President. It's been a wonderful opportunity. And we appreciate it very much. Thank you, everybody.
Good job, everybody. Nice. Good job, everybody. Thank you.